Hi, everyone, and welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. Before we get into any, everything else, uh, let me give you a couple things that are going on here at Cherry Avenue. In a couple of weeks on Sunday the 20th, we're going to have a fellowship lunch in the Family Life Center after the worship service. So we're asking folks to bring your favorite soup, stew, or chili, and dessert. Uh, you can keep your dish warm in the kitchen during the service, and then we'll enjoy a time of fellowship afterward. So make plans to join us for our fellowship lunch on February 20th, right after the worship service. And the junior and senior high youth are going snow tubing at Wintergreen on Thursday the 24th. The cost is $30, and that's due to Christie by February 10th. If you need more information, you can call the office or email me. I'll be glad to get you that. And I want to remind you about Celebrate Recovery every Tuesday night at 7. You know, we all have areas in our life that we need to work on. And CR helps us with all of our hurts, hang-ups, and habits. It's not just about overcoming addictions. And if you want to come and see what it's all about, I invite you to come, especially this week as we're going to hear testimony from the founders of Celebrate Recovery. And that's Tuesday night at 7 o'clock in the auditorium. Well, as we come to our prayer time today, I, I want to ask you to pray for Kiera W., who is recovering from a really bad knee injury. So we want to pray for her. We want to lift up Jeffrey M., who's fighting renal cancer. And we also pray for Robin S., who had heart valve replacement this past week and is recovering from that. And Stephen M., who's scheduled to have a heart valve replacement next week. So we want to pray for all of them. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise you for the fact that whatever happens in this world, you're there for us and you care about us. And we thank you for the answered prayers we've seen in those around us who've been sick or are facing physical issues and are recovering. We're so grateful for that. And we continue to lift up those around us, both the ones we've mentioned and the ones who have been on our prayer list for a while. Lord, you know their needs far better than we do. And we pray that you would work in their lives in a way you know is best. And Father, we ask that you would continue to bless and lead our church. I pray that we would follow your leading, trusting that you're going to work in a mighty way. We pray that the love and grace you've poured out on us would overflow out of us to our co-workers, our neighbors, our classmates, to everyone in our community. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been in our series going deep and we're looking at the book of first Corinthians and what it says about how we can develop a deeper faith. And so after a time of worship through song, we'll have part five using your gifts.
we've been walking through Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, one of the primary things they're struggling with that he addresses is division. There are several things that are causing division in the church, and he's trying to do everything that he can to correct that, because unity is so important in the church. And in chapter 12, he kind of hones in on the divisions caused by jealousy and pride over how different people are gifted. If you look through the New Testament, you find three chapters where Paul deals with the idea of spiritual gifts and service. Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and here in 1 Corinthians 12. And there are three basic themes that are covered in those chapters. Unity, diversity, and maturity. And he talks about our spiritual gifts as we go deeper in our faith and grow in our service. And the dominant theme we see in this chapter, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, is unity in diversity. That there are so many different gifts God gives his people through his spirit, but we are to each use our gifts to serve God as a unified body. You know, diversity is a good thing. It's actually a buzzword these days. But too often it's been divorced from the concept of unity. And when that happens, diversity devolves into divisiveness. By the same token, unity is crucial. But as Paul's going to show, if everyone's the same, we can't get the job done because we need different people with different talents to accomplish our unified goal. But when diverse people with varied gifts use those different gifts to accomplish a unified purpose, the world can get turned upside down. And that's what Paul's trying to spark in the Christians at Corinth, who just seem to be struggling with it. And in this chapter, Paul's going to tackle a problem they've been having at Corinth that's still common today at churches of all types and sizes. And that's that it's easy for us to sit on the sidelines rather than to get in the game and serve. If you work in the business world, you're pro probably familiar with uh, the principle that 20% of the people in an organization carry 80% of the workload. It's true in many companies and organizations, and it's true in a lot of churches. And if we're not careful, we can let ourselves get comfortable with the idea that someone else will take care of things and see the Christian life as sitting in church for an hour on Sunday rather than serving in a body of believers. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And I can tell you from growing up as a preacher's kid and 30 years of ministry myself that there are a handful of the same excuses people have for not ser serving. And we're going to look at mo the, some of the most common ones and we're going to see how 1 Corinthians 12 addresses them. Now, one common excuse is I have nothing to offer. I don't have any gifts I can use to serve. Every time I hear this, I think of Moses. God called him to lead his people out of Egypt, and Moses found various and creative ways to say, I don't have anything to offer. When God called Gideon to lead the Israelites against the Midianites, Gideon said, but, but I'm a nobody. My clan is the least in Manasseh, my family is the least in my clan, and I'm the least in my family. In other words, I'm not just a dog, I'm a pimple on a flea on a dog. And so often we have that same type of response to service today. Well, I'd love to help. I really would, but you know, I, just, I just don't have any talents. I just don't have anything to offer. Well, Paul hits on that pretty quickly. Look at verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in some men. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? It says all men. So what's God's response to our excuse? I've given gifts to everyone, he says. Paul says nobody's left out of this. Everyone has something to offer. Everyone brings something to the table. 
Why is it that we tend to feel inadequate? Well, sometimes it's because of our past. I think some of the folks at Corinth thought that way. Remember what Paul said in chapter 6? He said, you know, before you came to Christ, many of you were adulterers and prostitutes, homosexual offenders, idolaters, thieves, drunks, and liars. And they probably felt like they could never be used by God to do great things for his kingdom. And maybe you feel the same way. You know, it's too late for me. I've already blown it in life. I, I don't have anything to offer. But a quick scan through scripture proves that wrong. Have you committed adultery? So had King David. And God still did great things through him. Have a history of lying and deceit? So did Abraham and Isaac. Or maybe you've been involved with blatant sexual immorality. So had Rahab. She was a prostitute. Maybe you've had a temper that's gotten you into serious trouble. God used James and John, and he can do great things through you too. Maybe you have a history of quitting and not seeing things through. So did John Mark, but God used him also. And probably the most obvious example here is Paul himself. He used to persecute the church and had a hand in Christians being killed. And God used him to plant churches all over and to write a huge chunk of the New Testament. And I would encourage you to come to one of our large group meetings that celebrate recovery sometime and hear the testimonies of people whose past would make you cringe, who God is working in despite their past to do amazing things. And in many cases, using that past. So Paul says, maybe that was your past, but it's not who you are now. And in the last part of that section of chapter six, where he listed all the things they had done, he said, but that was then. This is now. You've been forgiven and washed clean. If this has been your excuse for sitting on the sidelines and not serving, if you just felt that you don't have anything to offer, I want to give you your new favorite verse of Scripture because it's one of my favorites too. It's Acts 4.13. It's, it's a time when the disciples are going through intense persecution for their faith, and they've been arrested for preaching about Jesus. And the officials looked at them and said this, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. When you feel like you don't have anything to offer, that you're just ordinary, remember that Christ is extraordinary, that he is all-sufficient, and he can use the skills you think are worthless to do valuable things for his kingdom. And despite any past, he can use that past to do great things. That may be one of the biggest encouragements we get from looking at the Christians at Corinth, that you don't have to be spiritual giants to be spiritually gifted. They were immature. They had a lot of problems, but God still empowered them to serve. And what we talk about and celebrate recovery all the time is that the very failure you think you can't put behind you can become the springboard that God uses to lead you to do things you never imagined you'd be doing. And Paul reminds us it's not our power that we're relying on. It's God's. Paul says in verse 6, the same God works all of them and all men. It's God who works. In verse 7, he says that our gifts are a manifestation of the Spirit. We're the glove, and God is the hand working in us. Well, another excuse people use is, I don't know where to serve. And we all have moments when we feel like that, but over time, it becomes less a reason and more an excuse. One of my professors in seminary was Dr. Lewis Foster. His father, Richard Foster, wrote the book that we had used as a textbook when we studied Life of Christ in, in uh, Bible college. And he wrote something that struck me. He wrote, there's a difference between choosing to serve and choosing to be a servant. When I choose to serve, I retain control about who I serve and when I serve. But when I choose to be a servant, I have given up all rights and all control. In other words, it's one thing to say, well, I'll be there Saturday from 1 to 3 to help with the event. It's another to make yourself available with whatever, that, whatever pops up. And so often, it's in doing that that you find the avenues where your gifts best meet the needs God puts in front of you. It's the difference between service being a lifestyle and it being just one more thing to check off your to-do list. Look at what Paul says in verse 8. 
He says, to one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now Paul lists nine gifts here, but these aren't nearly all of the gifts God gives us. When you look through those three chapters I mentioned, you'll find anywhere from 18 to 21 different gifts that the Bible talks about Christians having coming from his spirit. After Christ's resurrection and Christ's ascension, the Holy Spirit back in the first century gave out some miraculous gifts. And it was primarily so, uh, primarily that, that those who were preaching about Christ would have credibility. They had the ability to heal diseases or to speak in different languages or tongues. That was commonplace in that setting. But now we have the New Testament. They didn't have that. Our credibility comes by taking people back to the scriptures. So the miraculous gifts are not as necessary now as they were early in the spread of the gospel. Now, in a couple of weeks, when we're in chapter 14, we'll be able to take more of an in-depth look at those supernatural gifts and try to understand and see what their purpose is. But serving the church doesn't require supernatural gifts. It doesn't require a Bible college or seminary degree or any degree. It doesn't require a big bank account. It doesn't require you to be a certain age. All you have to have is a love for Christ. God's response to our excuse that I don't know where to serve is look for a need and fill it. And the strength of this church over the decades has been people who simply put Christ first, forgot about themselves, and made themselves available to serve. They simply looked around, saw a need, and filled it. There are so many creative ways to serve, regardless of who you are and sometimes where you are. One of my favorite examples was Marion Haddo. Marion was a longtime member here who was involved in a lot of things. She was a servant. One day I got called to the hospital that, uh, and she said she was ready to go and be with the Lord and they called in hospice. Well, a week or so later, they took her back to where she was at Charlottesville Health and Rehab. The next summer, she was still kicking. And when VBS was approaching, my wife asked her if she would be willing to put together little thank you bags that we gave to our volunteers. They were just little Ziploc bags with a couple of pieces of candy and a note with a bad pun. Okay, well, that's redundant. There aren't any, any good puns. But little notes of thanks to our volunteers. And we gave each volunteer a thank you bag each night. That's a lot of bags. But we brought the supplies over to her, and from her nursing home room, she filled hundreds and hundreds of bags. Here she was in a nursing home, unable to walk, but she found a way to serve. It was a lifestyle for her, and she never retired from being a servant. You see, in God's kingdom, everything is upside down from the way things are in this world. The first will be last, and the last will be first. The way to the top is to get to the bottom. You don't ascend the ladder of greatness, you descend the ladder of greatness. And in the church, there are no presidents. The highest position in the church is the position of a servant, because that's what Jesus was. And our job is to be like him. Well, there's another excuse you hear about in, uh, when it comes to service, and that's that I don't feel like serving. Now, this is one we don't say out loud. We keep that inside. I mean, really, why don't we serve? because we don't feel like serving. We don't think it's going to make us happy. We think happiness means having someone wait on us and serve us, not the other way around. We think about the day, a, a day at the beach or playing games with our friends. But in verse 12, Paul gives a powerful picture of what serving should be. It says this, the body is a unit, though it's composed of many parts. And although its parts are many, they are all they all form one body. So it is with Christ. That's how it is in the church. So Paul says that each of us is part of the body. There are so many different parts that allow the body to function. And look at verse 17. He says, 
If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Paul says we're all part of the body, and every single part is as important as the other parts. Now, if you notice here, Paul doesn't distinguish between supernatural gifts and the natural talents that we have that God provides us. That's because they're all being used to bring glory to God, and they're all important. We're all important parts of the body, and each part functioning as it should be allows the body to fulfill its purpose. So what happens when one part of the body, even if it's a small part, says, well, I don't feel like doing my part. I don't feel like it. Well, then the whole body is impacted. About 22 years ago, I hadn't been here very long, and I was playing basketball in the gym with some other guys, and I went up for a rebound, and I came down awkwardly, and my foot started hurting. And I grew up playing sports and getting dinged up and having my coaches yell, come on, walk it off, you know, suck it up, no pain, no gain. On top of that, I'm a guy, which means I'm stubborn. And after several weeks of limping around, people said, have you been to the doctor? And I said, look, they're just going to tell me to stay off of it, and I can't do that, so what's the point? And I limped around on it for months until softball season. And finally, during a softball game, I was on first base, and the guy at bat hit a line drive. I took off for second, and then the ball was caught, and I tried to stop and go back to first, and I just went down in a heap. So I finally went to the doctor. And when they x-rayed it, the doctor found a tiny break in a tiny little bone in my heel that I never even knew existed. And he fixed it. But the rest of my body was suffering. Because of the problem in my foot, my other leg was always sore from me favoring that side. And my back was always hurting because I was crooked all the time and not walking right. And it took a long time to get past that all from the impact of that little bone that I didn't even know existed. That's the picture that Paul paints of the church, that every single one of us has a role to play, and we depend on each other. So when you say, I don't feel like serving, everyone is impacted by that. So what's God's response to our excuse? He says, walk with the Spirit and let Him change your heart. How do you overcome that indifference? Paul gives it here. Throughout this passage, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Our gifts of service flow from our walk with the Spirit. And rather than trying to change how we feel about serving, we should be focusing on our walk with the Spirit and allowing Him to change our heart. When you're serving, but you're not walking with the Spirit, it doesn't take long for that to drain you. You won't look forward to it. But when you're walking with the Spirit, when it's coming from the Spirit within you, it makes all the difference. The other thing I'd say is to start right away. Don't put it off. Start now. Most of us plan on serving at some point. I mean, we don't feel like it now, but we don't mean we'll never serve. So we don't say, I don't feel like serving. What we say is, well, you know, when things settle down, uh, then I'll serve. When all of my kids are in school, then I'll serve. Or once I close this big deal, then I'll serve. When I retire, then I'll serve. But we need to start today. We can't put it off. Well, there's one other excuse, and that's this one. I'm not really needed. And sometimes we say that to sound humble. Sometimes it's a sign of a real inferiority complex. And it seems like we humans go to one of two extremes. We either think that we're God's gift to the world, or we think, oh, God could never use me. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. You are so valuable that Jesus died for you personally. He looked at you and he said, I'd rather die than be in heaven without you. Look at what Paul says, starting in verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, 
while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So God answers our excuse and says, every part of the body is important. Paul points out, using the analogy of the body again, that the church is the body of Christ, that all of the parts of the body, even those that are less visible, are equally important. Sometimes we think that it's just the visible parts of the body that are most important. But the fact is that it's the parts of the body we don't see that tend to have the most uh, sense of vitality. You, you can survive without a hand, but as one of my kids used to say, you can't live without a liver. Every one of us is important to the body, to making it function as it should. And we see this constantly in the life of the church. Most of the time, nobody notices who's back running the sound in the computer. But if they weren't there, you'd spend the whole sermon going, what did he say? And the work that I've done on the message would be pointless. If you don't have young children, you probably never notice the ladies who spend the worship service downstairs teaching the kids. But they're vital. You don't see Bob Archer over there plowing the parking lot when it snowed. But if he, if he hadn't, we wouldn't have been able to have church when it snows. Most of us don't see Billy Marsh out there several times a week working and fixing things in the building or when people go and visit our folks who are in the nursing homes or are homebound and Joyce keeping the library going or the ladies who send cards to the sick and on and on and on. People doing things that don't get their picture in the paper, they're not up for front where you see them, but are actively serving and doing it for an audience of one doing it for the Lord and not for men. I love what Rick Warren said. He said, God gave me a gift, not for me, but for you. And God gave you a gift, not for you, but for me. And if I don't use the gifts God has entrusted to me, then I'm robbing you. And if you don't use the gifts that God has entrusted you with, then you're robbing me. You see, we're the body of Christ and we work together. God is has compiled this group of people to be his body, to serve others, and to glorify him. Look at verse 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. That's so true. I think that's one of the greatest traits of this church over the years. When someone's hurting, the people here do a great job of coming alongside them and helping them out. When my wife was having those mini strokes in 2015 and nearly died, you all provided meals, sent cards, you made yourselves available to help our kids if they needed it while we were at the hospital so much. It was wonderful. And almost every family in this church could tell a story like that. And that's the way the church should be. The harder part sometimes is rejoicing with those who rejoice. It's a little tougher to do that when your roommate gets asked out by the guy you were hoping would ask you out. Or there's a way you'd like to serve, but those doors haven't opened up for you. Or when someone sings a song up front and gets praise and pats on the back, and you've worked in the background for years and years and nobody seems to notice. It can be hard to rejoice with those who rejoice sometimes. But please understand this. When we're gathered together as a church body, we're more than a team. It's more than an organization. It's the church. We are the body of Christ. Paul says in verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Now, I try to prepare my sermons a little early because I record the online sermon ahead of time so I can edit it and then post it on Sunday morning. And there's a lot that has to be done along with that. So I try to do the prep work a few weeks ahead. And as I was reading through stuff from this chapter a couple of weeks ago, the week where we got the larger snow, I became convicted of the need to be more of a servant at home. You know, Christy's usually the last one to leave her school in the afternoons, not every day, but a lot. And you know, then has to answer parent emails and post lesson plans and all that. And I just became convicted of the need to get out of my comfort zone and do some things now that don't really come naturally to me. 
And I'm not a super husband or anything, but I did take a bottle of water out to her as she shoveled the snow. I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything, but you know. <laughs> Is there someone in your life, some cause in your heart? Is there some neighbor in need? Is there a coworker in crisis? Is there a burden among your brothers and sisters in Christ or a job to be done in the church where rather than just choosing to serve, instead you can choose to be a servant? Maybe you're wondering, how do I get to that point? Maybe you've tried to make changes, but they just haven't happened yet. Or maybe you've been trying to do it all under your own power. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't try to do this all by yourself. You weren't meant to. So how do we have the power of the Holy Spirit? By turning our lives over to Christ. Verse 3 of this chapter says that we know we have the Spirit because we say Jesus is Lord. When we make him Lord of our life by repenting of our sins and being baptized into him and looking to walk with him each day, he's promised to put his Spirit in us. And if you're ready to do that, I'd love to talk to you about that anytime. But it starts with our decision not to just settle for sitting and watching others, or even just for serving, but for being a servant. To live out your role as the vital part of the body you are, whatever that part is. In the chapter we looked at today, chapter 12, Paul goes to great lengths to answer the excuses we give for not being servants. As we come to communion, I can't help but think of the excuses Jesus could have made to avoid coming to earth and sacrificing himself for us. He could have said, it's too hard. Heaven is perfect and earth is far from it. And I don't want to deal with all the things that that would mean. He could have said, it's too painful. Crucifixion is agonizing and humiliating. I don't want to go through that. He could have said, they don't deserve it. They've done nothing but disobey. He could have said, I don't deserve that and he didn't. But he didn't offer excuses. Scripture says he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that's why we celebrate communion, to remember his willingness to sacrifice his body and blood for us. He took the punishment he didn't deserve so that we could have the forgiveness and grace that we didn't deserve. Scripture says the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread together. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take of the cup together. Let's pray. Father, we're so incredibly grateful that Jesus was willing to take the punishment we deserve so that we could have eternal life. And I pray that you would touch our hearts in a special way and help us to live in light of that sacrifice, sharing his love with those around us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Well, I wanna thank you so much for being with us today. And if you ever have questions or wanna talk about your relationship with Christ, I would love to do that. Just call the office or email me and we'll plan to do that. I hope you have a great week. God bless.